Hello everybody, welcome to the Voice of Faith. So glad you are here today. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to open them please to Psalm 91. Wednesday night we began a new series entitled In His Presence. And that CD is out there. So we are current on our CDs. We're up to date. The last two messages are back there. Since this is part two, and you missed part one, I recommend you get the CD and listen to it and catch up with us. Yesterday, I told Leanne, I said, I'm going to go give the devil a fit. So I went for a drive. I got my truck and went up to the mountains for about three hours and spent some time praising the Lord and rebuking the devil and praising the Lord and rebuking the devil and praising the Lord and rebuking the devil and just giving him a fit and got pretty loud about it. So... Uh, your pastor's a little fired up this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I like giving him a fit. Amen. Amen. And there was a scripture, you're going to be surprised at this, but there was a scripture in Proverbs that never really spoke to me. I heard it preached on a few times, but never really did anything for me. But I heard a teaching about it, and uh, I saw it. I saw it. How many understand? Saw it. When it's real to you, it will work for you, right? And so, the Bible says in Proverbs, if you catch a thief, he has to return sevenfold. And we know who the thief is, according to John 10. So I demanded some sevenfold return. It's going to cost him because he's messed with me. And it's going to cost him because he's messed with you. Amen? I'm so thankful the last week the Lord spoke to me that word rebuke. And I have been using it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Psalm 91. Are you there? Yes, sir. All right. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror uh, uh, by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold, and see the reward of the wicked. i got to stop at verse 7 for a moment. The Lord wants me to share this with you. Uh, years ago, I don't know how many of you know uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Willie George. Uh, but he, him and his family went, took a trip to the Grand Canyon, and they were there and having a good time. Well, his little boy kind of went away and went out in the parking lot, and this car was headed right toward him, and the driver didn't see. And so Willie George cries out, and he says, in the natural, the car missed his son by less than an inch. And he said, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. He said, he said that was a close one. That was a close one. And the Lord says, no, no, it wasn't. He says, yes, it was. Lord, I saw it. It was a close one. The Lord said, no, no, it wasn't. He said, Lord, I saw it. It was a close one. And the Lord opened his eyes, and he saw angels. And the Lord said, see, it wasn't a close call at all. <laughs> Amen. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but that's not even a close call for us. Hmm. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Who's the dragon? Yeah. Who? That's right, that's right. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Hallelujah. Now, I read all that once again for a reason, and that is this. There are many promises that come with abiding in God's presence. It is to your benefit to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. I'll say that again. There are many promises that come with abiding in God's presence. God wants us to live in His presence. He doesn't want us just to visit Him. He wants us to live in His presence. Amen. Amen. We made this theme at Wednesday night. Living in God's presence is the normal Christian life. That's what we're called to. That's home for us. That's our place of security is living in God's presence. That's normal for you and I. It's abnormal for Christians not to live in God's presence. It's abnormal for Christians to visit and then leave. God has a better plan for us than just visiting Him. Amen. Amen. A visit's nice, but living with Him is a whole lot better. <laughs> Hallelujah. So many of our problems come from not being aware of His presence. A lot of mental problems, a lot of emotional problems. So many of our problems come from not being aware of His presence. Now, this is just one area. In order for you to sin, you have to put God totally out of your mind. You have to push away that God consciousness and get Him totally out of your mind. And you never give Him a thought until the deed is done. And then you turn back to Him, turning your spiritual life on and off. There's benefits to living in His presence. There's problems by not being aware of His presence. You cannot sin as a Christian and being aware that God's with you. That He's with you, He's watching you, He knows your thoughts, He knows what you're doing. You cannot sin if you have a God awareness. But when you push that aside for however long, even if it's just 15, 20 seconds to do something, and then you turn back around, there He is waiting for you. Because He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And I'm thankful for that. But how embarrassing to turn around and there he is. Oh, if our eyes could be open. Right? If our eyes could be open to know who's with us at all times. You're never alone. It's totally impossible for you to be alone. You have an angel assigned to you. God is with you. Amen. Mama's probably watching you. <laughs> My mama had eyes in the back of her head. It's amazing. The stuff she knew. She still knows more now. She's in heaven. I'm being good, Mama. I'm being good. I just want you to know that. That whipping's lasted. <laughs> All these years, that whipping's lasted, Mama. <laughs> Your life would be totally different if you resisted temptation. Your faith would be strong, you'd be bold, you'd be confident. Your life would be so different if you lived the life of resisting sin and not yielding to it. We wouldn't be at a different place. Your life would be totally different. There's not a moment that God is not with you. Not a moment of your life that God is not with you. And I'm thankful for that. Because during those times of temptation and pressure, He's there by your side to give you aid, to give you the strength you need. I want to read verse 1 again. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Dwelling in God's presence is, I believe, the missing element for so many Christians. Amen. It's the missing element. They've heard a lot of good sermons. They've watch DVDs, they've listened to CDs, they've taken notes, they go to church, but there's something missing in their life and they, knew, they know instinctively, if I can find this one element, so many of these things I've learned will work for me a whole lot better. And the missing element is learning to live in His presence. It's dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. It's the missing element. It's so simple, we've missed it. We've stumbled over it. Once again, a lot visit the Lord, but they do not abide. And so I want to ask you a question today as we move into this, because we got some things to look at. My question to you is this, how, or I'll make the statement first, how you see God is going to determine to a large degree if you live in the secret place. So my question to you is, how do you see God? What is your opinion of Him? Many Christians are not ready to dwell in the secret place because their view, their opinion, their perception of God is wrong. 
They think God is up there with a big stick, ready to beat you every time you do wrong. Who wants to be in the presence of someone like that? So in order for you to live in the secret place, you must have a right concept of who God is. So I'm going to begin with a thing that I've been taught for years that was wrong. And I, most everybody that I know think that this is pretty common knowledge. But the truth is opposite. Would it shock you to know that God will never, ever be mad at you? Amen. Most Christians believe that God is mad at them. He's highly ticked off. And just one more thing, and bam, you are in trouble. But the Bible tells us that God will never be mad at us again. Go with me, please, to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. Now, what comes before Isaiah 54? 53. That's profound, isn't it? Isaiah, well, let me read the verses. Isaiah 54. God will never be mad at you again. I'm going to prove this to you with more than one scripture, and I'm going to show you why it's true. Isaiah 54, verse number 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. How do we know that that applies to us? Because Isaiah 54 is the result of Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is the great redemptive chapter of what Jesus did for us. And God is saying, I swear to you, just like I swore that the waters would no more flood the earth, I swear to you that I'll never be angry with you, I'll never rebuke you. And the vast majority of Christians do not believe that, do not know that. And so they are hesitant to live in the secret place. Your concept of God must be right, and the right concept is Scripture. Amen. Look at Isaiah 59. Verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Brothers and sisters, the vast majority of Christianity is stuck right there. They believe that if they sin, they're separated from God. Your sins do not separate you from God when you make Jesus your Lord. Your sins separated you from God before you made Jesus your Lord, but after you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, your sins will never separate you from God. But Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, oh, glory to God, here it comes, hallelujah. Woo. Holy Ghost bumps all up and down me. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that because of his blood, we are able to draw near. Jesus changed everything the way it's done. And we're still plagued with Old Testament, Old Covenant mentality when things are made new in Christ. Because of Jesus, there is no more separation. Because of Jesus, there is no more separation. Your sins will not separate you from God after you after you become a Christian. Now your sins will affect your conscience and your conscience will deal with you. But God is not going to leave you because you blow it. It's amazing how we full gospel people preach to the sinner. God loves you. God loves you. God, come get saved. God loves you. But then after you get saved, you better watch it. Oh, God's going to be mad at you. You better watch it. We should have left the sinner alone. He would have been better off. 
If I'm a sinner, I know God loves me. I get to be his child. I get beat around. Should have wore blue jeans today is the point. Because I, taught, I was taught growing up that you don't wear blue jeans or you'll go to hell. I should have wore them in my, blue, in my cowboy boots today. Because I was free. All. Say all. all. One more time. All. all of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. All sin has been paid for. Right? Because of this, there isn't any wrath of God left for your sin. All of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. Because of this, there isn't any wrath of God left for your sin. He poured it all out on Jesus. God has no anger left for you. This is the age of grace. Now, when the rapture happens and the tribulation period comes, it's a different story. But right now, we are in a covenant of grace, and God has no anger towards you. He poured it all out on Jesus. So every thought, every feeling you've ever had of, oh, no, oh, my God, he's mad at me, was false. It was deception. It was a lie of the enemy. I don't care what you felt, God didn't feel anger towards you because he poured it all out on Jesus. All of us are falling short in seeking God. I told, I told the aunt Friday, Friday night was the ladies' meeting, and I said, now look, I'm going to get in the Word, I'm going to study, I'm going to pray. This is my night. Got closer to her leaving, and I really, I just want to do something else. I want to sit down and watch John Wayne. And so she left, and I went to Dairy Clean and got a banana split, brought it back home, sat down, put in John Wayne, watched Chisholm, and ate my banana split, and I did not seek the Lord. And I told the Lord, I said, I just really want to relax tonight. I had zero guilt, no problems. And believe it or not, when I sat down to eat my banana split, Jesus sat down right next to me. Nobody seeks God like they're supposed to. But Jesus died to make up the difference and a whole lot more. Amen. Saturday, I made up for it. I went to the mountains for three hours and gave the devil a fit. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus made the difference. Through Jesus, a way has been opened so you can live in God's presence right now in your imperfections. Amen. Through Jesus, a way has been opened. For you to live in God's presence right this moment, even in your imperfections. There's a, a woman I remember witnessing two years ago, and sometimes a word from God is not always positive. I went and told this lady, she's got four little boys. I said, you've got to get in church. I said, if you don't get in church, here's what's going to happen. I said, this boy here is going to wind up in jail. This boy here is going to wind up on drugs. And I gave her a prophetic word for all of her kids. And I said, you've got to get in church. She goes, when I get myself cleaned up and ready, then I'll go. I said, you're missing the point. I said, that's why Jesus is for. He's here to wash you, cleanse you, and help you. She goes, no, when I, when I get ready, and then, I'll, then I'll go. I said, if you don't, here's what's going to happen to your boys. She never went. The boy I prophesied over went to jail. Of the boy went, got on drugs, killed himself. And today, she's bitter and blames God. Is that God's fault? No. Jesus had made a way for her to enter in and live in God's presence, even in her imperfections. Right? You've got to get rid of the guilt and condemnation that many, many people live with. You've got to relate to God not on the basis of your performance, but you've got to relate to Him on the basis of His goodness and His love toward you. This is how you fellowship with him. This is how you get in his presence and stay there is you talk to him and you worship him and fellowship with him based on who he is and what he's done for you. 
You've got to focus on his goodness and his forgiveness. You've got to have an attitude of, thank, of thankfulness and of love and, and just going to him and appreciating what he's done for you. Right? If you go to God and you say this, Oh, God, I don't know how you could ever love someone like me. It will bring guilt and condemnation and it will cut off your fellowship with him. Right. You do not go to God telling him, I don't know how you could choose me. I don't know how you can lose me. I don't know how you can love me. That's not what he wants to hear. And if that's, the way you're, if that's your basis of approach, no wonder why you're not fellowshipping. No wonder why you're not hearing him. And no wonder why you're not enjoying his presence is you're coming to him based on your faults and flaws as opposed to based on, based on the blood. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's read in 1 John, please. 1 John 3. I'm going to tell you how to be God's best friend. How many here has a best friend in the natural? Mm -hmm. Or a real close friend? Let me tell you what they all have in common. They all like you. And they t talk to you about you. And they talk to you about you and about your finer points and how they appreciate you and how they like you. That's why they're your best friend. If you will go to God and tell him how awesome he is, how good and kind and loving he is, you're going to get to know him. Not because he's egocentric, because he's full of pride. It's not for him, it's for you. Because yeah. when you talk to him about how great he is, the more you talk to him like that, the more you see the reality of that. I believe he gets personal benefit from that, but it definitely affects you. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, <laughs> one of the things I like to do is I like to say, Father... Would you look at Jesus? Isn't he something? You just have an awesome son. Just look how beautiful he is. What do you think about him, Father? You know, I sure do appreciate him. You know, Father, he sure is a good Savior. Amen. And so I'll talk to the Father about Jesus. Jesus, look at the Father. Isn't he awesome? You know, he's the best dad in the universe. Amen. Yeah. Holy Ghost, look at the Father. Look at Jesus. Just what do you think? Yeah, aren't they awesome? Talk to each member of the Godhead about the other members, and they will respond to you. Amen. And that's the way I learned how to distinguish the voice of the Father, the voice of the Son, and the voice of the Holy Ghost. Because all three of them, they don't sound alike. They have a different voice. Amen. You can get that close to God. Jesus, I'm sure glad you brought me the Holy Ghost. He's the best comforter. You know, he shows me your things and he makes them real to me. He's the best teacher. Thank you, Jesus, for sending me the Holy Ghost. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. According to this scripture and many others, we are right now the children of God. We're sons and daughters of God. And as he is, so are we in this world. But this thought came to me, so I want you to understand what I'm saying. One million years from today, God knows where you will be. He knows what you will look like. He will know everything about you. I am convinced that God deals with us on the basis of what we will be like a million years from today. And for him, anything less would be dishonest. One million years in the glory of God, you're going to look considerably better than you do now. And you're all looking sharp. You're all looking good. But you're going to look a whole lot better of one million years in the presence of God. No sin, no corruption, no fall, no curse. You're going to be greatly improved in your soul and in your body. 
And God sees you that way and he deals with you now based on that. And so we got to come up in our thinking to understand that that's the way he's dealing with us. Once again, for anything less, he would be dishonest. Oh, the wheels be spinning right now. One million years from today, you will be alive, you'll be thinking, you'll be breathing, you'll be making decisions, you'll be talking to people, you'll be going and doing. And you'll be more alive then than you are now. Because you won't have this flesh to deal with to hold you back. You and I, this just came up, thank you, Holy Ghost. You and I will be learning at the speed of light for one million years. And God still will know more than you. When man fell in the garden, it was a huge fall. And when he fell, he fell into himself. His spirit no longer was the dominant one. His flesh, his body that was supposed to be the servant was now the master. And he fell from the glory of God all that height down to the depth of the deepest parts of him. The fall of man was huge. And God is in the process of restoring us back to where we should be. Amen. Legally, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's a spiritual reality that will one day be a physical reality for you and I. Praise God. Okay. You cannot overcome sin by your own strength and some standard. You need His presence. I think you're going to like this. The presence of God is the downfall of the enemy. The presence of God is the downfall of the enemy. Isn't that true? The presence of God is the downfall of the enemy. You're not going to win this battle on your own. You need His presence. You don't need, you know, I like westerns and cowboy stuff, and they got the thing called the cowboy code. And I've read it. You know, it's, it's nice. It's, it's nice. But if you don't have the life of God on the inside of you, yeah, you ain't got nothing. You just got spurs. <laughs> the presence of God is the downfall of the enemy. And he's the downfall of the enemy in your life when his presence is so manifested. Read with me in 2 Corinthians 5. Do you understand that the devil does not want you to live in God's presence? He wants you so distracted that you don't have time for God. And if you don't have time for God, you're too busy. Learn to do things unto Him. Learn to do things with an awareness of His presence. Now, I know some people, I need to make this statement as we go farther into the, this series. Some people have a job where they have to mentally uh, concentrate because people's lives are at stake. Yeah. All right? And people have responsibilities. And so God blessed you with that job. You don't need to feel guilty that you have to concentrate mentally on that position. But when you're done, turn your attention back to the Lord. Okay? And when you go into work, say, Lord, I'm doing this for the people, but I'm doing it as unto you. Right? Now, there are some... Some jobs where someone has to mentally apply themselves, but they will, in their job, find themselves worrying. If you can worry on the job, you can meditate on God on the job. Right. Living in His presence is normal for us. In first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I've got some awesome news for you today. God is not recording your sins. God does not know how many times you have sinned. God does not know how many times you have sinned. Because He's not counting them up. He's not recording them. He's not imputing them against you. He does not know how many times you have sinned. So if you have an area where you're falling in continually, do not go to God and say, God, this is my 47th time. Because to Him, it'll be your first. And that will produce guilt and condemnation in you. It's your first time as far as He's concerned. And if it is your 47th time, you repent and you say, Lord, I need help. So I'm just going to enter in. I'm going to draw closer to you and enter into your presence because your presence is the downfall of my enemies. But God does not know how many times you have sinned. He's not recording them. Wow, it's quiet in this Presbyterian church. I thought you'd all be up running around screaming, hallelujah, because some of you have sinned a lot. <laughs> God put your sins on Jesus. Amen. It's so easy to dwell in God's presence if you keep your mind on your redemption. God forsook Jesus the way he should have forsaken us. Right? Right? He was on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he have to experience that? Because that would have been our experience. God forsook Jesus the way he should have forsaken us. Jesus took our place. God forsook Jesus. He'll never forsake you. Right? Didn't he say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you? He'll never forsake you because he forsook Jesus. He took our place. He put our sins on the Lord Jesus. Jesus suffered so you don't have to, right? Amen. Okay. You ready? Sin cannot be paid for twice. Sin cannot be paid for twice. What you're going through is needless. In a sense, we're putting Jesus in double jeopardy every time we suffer for our sins. You can't pay for sins twice. Man commits a crime, goes to jail for 10 years, he comes out for six days, they stick him back in to do another 10 for the same crime? No, he already paid the price. Jesus paid the price for your sins so you don't have to. You shouldn't suffer for your sins. Jesus suffered so you wouldn't have to suffer for them. You can't pay for sin twice. It's these revelations that will cause us to run into His presence and live there because there's nothing between me and God. There's no sin. There's no guilt. There's no shame in His presence. When He looks at us, He sees purity. Amen. <clears throat> there's a place for us, but we've got to get rid of the guilt and condemnation. I think most Christians are convinced that God is displeased with them. Some way, some area of my life, I know God can't be pleased with me. That is a lie of the enemy. Listen, when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, that pleased the Father to the max. There's nothing else you could do to top that. When you received His Son, you pleased the Father. If you go around with this thinking and this feeling God's not pleased with me, that is of the devil and you've got to rebuke it because that will keep you from living in the secret place. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, how can you live in this secret place of the Most High if you think God is displeased with you? See what I mean by that? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation 
to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. All, pardon me, a love that's tied to performance is not love at all. A love tied to performance is not love at all. So God's love for you is unconditional. It's not based upon what you do or what you don't do. A love that is based on performance is not love at all. That ought to set somebody free in here. I'm coming to discover something about the Lord. I know that I'm beautiful and wonderful. And I know you're beautiful and wonderful too. But God really doesn't love you because of you. He loves you because He is love. That's really the best place to be. He just loves you because He loves you. We were watching the movie The Shack last night. I really like the movie. I like, I like Papa. I like that, that black lady. I just want to go up and give her a hug. I just thought she was a great Abba father. So I like Papa. But anyway, oh, I got off on what I was going to say. Oh, she said, she had mentioned someone. She goes, you know, I, I feel quite fond about so-and-so. I feel quite fond about so-and-so. Well, the, the guy says to her he, one day, he says, is there anybody you don't feel fond about? She goes, come to think of it, No. <laughs> God feels fond about you. Hallelujah. All right. There is no condemnation. Now, the word condemnation, as we've talked about here in the church, if there's a, 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 in the city a, a house or a building and it's condemned, the city will come out, they'll, they'll tap up, you know, they'll put a thing up there. It says, this building's condemned. Condemned means it's not fit to be used. It's not fit to live in. Right? The Bible says there's, there's no condemnation. If you feel unfit... For use, you are experiencing condemnation. If you feel unfit for use, you are experiencing condemnation. Hmm. But Phil, I've not been trained in such and such an area. Phil, I don't have a grace for such and such an area. I understand that. But the Bible says in Corinthians that God is our sufficiency. God is your sufficiency. If you feel unfit for use, you're experiencing condemnation. The devil has tacked upon your heart, this building's condemned. It's not fit to be used. But the Bible says there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Right? To dwell in God's presence is to dwell in His love. Stop beating yourself up. To dwell in God's presence is to dwell in His love. He loves you. He accepts you. He's not displeased with you. He's not angry at you. If you dwell upon your sins, faults, failures, and shortcomings, you will not be able to live in the secret place. The the, the key to this is constantly be thinking about the goodness of God. As we close today, let's go to Zephaniah. And I know that's one of your favorite books. <laughs> Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. Sounds like a Western. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Here comes the three guys. Zephaniah, Zechariah. You know. <laughs> Amen. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah is a book about judgment. It's a book about how God's people have to go into captivity, and it's about God's judgment. And I want you to notice that at the end of this this book, this prophet prophesies by the Spirit of God, and he says this in verse 17. 3, Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. 
This is the concept, the opinion, the view that you need to have of God. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. What does the word midst mean? Hmm? In his presence? In. Okay. Am I, am I in your midst right now? If God is in our midst, if he's with us, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's mighty. Everywhere he goes, everywhere you go, he goes, and Mr. Mighty is following you. I just had this picture of Mr. Clean. But it's only Jesus of Nazareth. He's bigger than Mr. Clean. He's bigger than Mr. T. And Jesus will not say, you fool. <laughs> the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. You don't put God out. When he looks at you, he smiles. Not one amen. amen. He rejoices over you. How many here has ever been married? Remember your first week of honeymoon? Do you remember how you rejoiced over your spouse? The Lord rejoices over you. He will rest in his love. Who's his love? Us. He will rest in us. He will rest in us. I want to just sit on my wife for a moment. I want to rest. God rest in us. And he rests on us because we are his love. That means he's comfortable with us. That means he enjoys our presence. He will joy over thee with singing. I would love to get the CD on that one, Sister, uh, Sister Sally. Jesus singing over you. Now, I am not, you guys know, well, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this. I know I'm going to get in trouble. Oh, well. The Hebrew says <laughs> that he dances and twirls violently as he sings over us. He is violently twirling over your head singing songs because he's madly in love with you. That is the concept you need as opposed to God's going to get angry with me if I do the next thing wrong. Amen. To live in the secret place of the Most High, you've got to know he loves you. He wants you in his presence. He's not mad at you. He'll never rebuke you. You cannot make him mad. You can make him sad. But you can't make him mad. Oh Lord, open our ears. Let us hear. Let us hear what you're singing over us. Don't you know Jesus has the most beautiful voice of every man, any man ever? What a voice. And he's singing over you. Songs of deliverance and songs of love and songs of blessing. It's easy to live in the secret place when you get that. Amen? We've been lied to. The church religion has lied to us. God's mad at you, and he's, he's out to get you. There's a song that says God's going to get you for that. So, actually, some southern gospel person wrote a song called God's going to get you for that. If God was going to get you, you would have been got by now. I would have been got a long time ago. I would have never made it out of my teens. If I was going to get got, amen? Amen. Let's stop. Let's think this through. We've been lied to about you've got to do this and you've got to do that and it's got to be just perfect. Papa wants a family. Amen. He wants sons and daughters. He's, he wants a big family that he can love on and fellowship with and share his, his heart with and we can share our heart with him. It's about love. It's about a relationship. It's not about do's and don'ts. And people get upset with this kind of preaching because they say, Oh, you're preaching grace. You're preaching. You just do anything you want. And because all your sins are taken care of, past, present, future. That's right. They are. But you will live holy. You will live more holy on, on, by accident than on purpose when you really love him. Amen. When you love him and you know he loves you, you don't want to do the junk. I'm too busy listening to him singing to me. To me, go do junk. 
I'm too busy being in his presence. The world and its glitter has no pull, no attraction for me. I've seen through the glitter. I know it's death. The apple's got a worm in it. Right? Jesus paid the price. You don't have to pay the price for your sins. But if you will live in his presence, it'll be the downfall of your enemy. And it's the easiest way to crucify your flesh is when you're praising him and you're caught up into him. This, this pull of our flesh, this, this pull, and sometimes we get those temptations and we get that pull and we think, man, I don't like that, what's going on? That will happen less and less as we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Oh, I'm going to tell myself, it's a good one, but it's all right. I was coming home, I was in the truck, and, and there's this girl, he came out of the house, and she was going to her car, and her car was parked right by the street. And I looked at her, and I thought, that is a good-looking woman. And my next thought was, I'm so glad I'm in the secret place. I had no other thought other than just recognizing she was a pretty woman. My wife doesn't know the story. But I was praying in tongues and so caught up in his presence, the pull to look wasn't there. I noticed, and I, I just, boom, I'm right back in the secret place. Because I'm determined to be a man who lives there. The pull of the flesh just doesn't happen when you're living in his presence. Amen. I'll say this and I'll quit. She was a fine looking woman. But that was it. I was just boom. Done. I'm done. Now I could have. My wife wouldn't have known. You wouldn't have known. My conscience would have. But it doesn't hold anything when you're living in his presence. Amen. Doesn't the scripture says, say this, that in the, his presence is fullness of joy and in his right hand are pleasures forevermore? Yes. The pleasures of the spirit are still greater than the pleasures of the flesh Amen. because the pleasures of the flesh bring death. The pleasures of the spirit bring life. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress. What do you say about your God? What you say about Him is going to determine if you live there. Is He mean? Is He grouchy? Is He hard to please? What do you say about your God? I'll tell you about mine. He loves me. And right now, He's singing over me with songs of joy. Amen. I'm special. And so are you. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message today. We appreciate it. Until next time, we gather around the good word of God. Remember these words, be not afraid, only believe.